Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar today. We're delighted to have you join us for the presentation on what does cloud computing hold for the future. We're joined by Gaurav Malik, who is the Senior Lecturer in Computer Science at the School of Architecture, Computer Science and Engineering in the, at the University of East London. So we will hear from him very shortly, but just before I pass you over to Gaurav, I just want to reiterate how the webinar portal works. You will see a question drop down menu and in there you can ask any questions. We highly encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as at the end of the presentation, what we will do is we will pose those questions to Gaurav at the very end. But of course you can ask questions at the very end, but it just helps if you think of anything, feel free to pop it in the question box. And we really encourage you to lean into the subject at hand and ask questions regarding the subject that our Gaurav is talking about. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Gaurav who will kick off the presentation. Thanks so much, Gaurav. Thanks very much, Annabelle. Uh, thank you and everyone, welcome to today's session. What does cloud computing hold for the future? So hopefully what I'll do is I'll start with a bit of introduction to what is cloud computing and then take you on a journey how I foresee cloud computing to be traveling in the next few years. Now some of these things have already happened, some of these things may be happening, but then some of these things happen you know, because of the people who are behind it. So we we'll start with a bit of introduction first. So my name is Gaurav Manik, as Annabel said. Uh, I'm one of the academics on the computing team at UEL. I'm the course leader for the MSc computing, uh, cloud computing program. I also teach the cloud computing module on our MSc computer science program and the cloud computing module is shared amongst uh, some of the other programs which I'll be talking to you too as the latter part of the presentation. I am also an AWS cloud ambassador having joined when the scheme was launched last year. Very proud of uh, you know, to have been selected a few of us around the world so that's you know was quite a bit of a, you know, it's good to be recognized for my efforts. And my research interests lie around computer science education, uh, you know, outreach, you know, getting, uh, you know, tackling the gender imbalance that you have within computer science and basically reaching out to uh, the young to make them look at computer science as a career path. I also have an interest in smart cities. Uh, and again, you can kind of see, you know, where I'm going, because obviously all of these things are connected to cloud computing. And only recently we've just, uh, today was the last day of our cloud computing summer school. And I know that many of the students who were in the summer school are in this presentation as well. So welcome. And my last interest is in cloud computing. So th that's a bit about myself. So a bit about what is cloud computing. So cloud computing can be broadly defined as a delivery of computing services whether it be servers, storage, databases, networking, software, analytics, intelligence, and more over the internet to offer innovation, flexible resources, and economies of scale. And, and I think it's quite important to see how cloud computing has come, uh, because if you remember, if you look at the olden days of computing, you had people who were stuck around terminals, which are connected to a big mainframe. And in a way, the computing industry has gone around in a full circle. So we saw the rise of uh, microcomputers where everybody had a, you know, a computer on the desk, you know, with 16 gig RAM, if not more, and a hard drive. But now all I need to do many of my uh, courses and many of the stuff that I teach is all I need is a browser. So, you know, you need to ask yourself, if I'm not processing things locally, why do I need to have this really powerful machine? If all I need is a browser so I can connect to the cloud and let the cloud do the number crunching for me. And one of the things about cloud computing, also we recognize it as a utility because you only pay for it when you use it. And uh, many of us may not realize it, that we are actually consumers of cloud computing you know, if you're using email, if you're, you know, using online banking, because once again, all you have is a browser or a mobile phone to really tap into the power of the cloud. So we're looking at sharing of uh, IT resources, which are accessible remotely. As I said, all you need to have on your computer is a browser, which is why you've seen the rise of devices like uh, Chromebook, where you know people are able to carry out stuff just by having a browser accessible to the cell. 
we are able to rapidly scale resources, uh, you know, with elastic with minimal uh, effort, but we are also able to scale back resources. And again, one of the things about cloud computing is that you're always looking at uh, making uh, savings. You benefit from economies of scale, right, due to multi-tenancy in terms of security, you know, maintainability, reliability. And again, you at the end of the day, nobody can look after computers better than people who do it for their day-to-day -day business. And uh, once again, you need to ask yourself and for many IT departments, is there much sense in us running an, I, an IT department keeping servers on our premises when we can outsource this into the cloud? So during 2000s, you had the concept of pooling resources and we had remote hosting started evolving, which led to things like grid computing, utility computing. And again, if you look back at any of the, I'm a big fan of movies. And if you look at any of the movies in the past, if you remember Sandra Bullock's The Net, right? You had people, you know, sitting opposite uh, machines with, uh, you know, green font and terminals. And all you were doing is you were connecting to some system sitting in the background. So in Amazon in August 2006, uh, AWS was launched and was established and launched. And in 2008, you had Google App Engine and 2010, you had Microsoft Azure. So this area has now become, so now you have established market players in the industry, right? It's not just one company who is uh, monopolizing the whole thing. You know, they all have their advantages. They all have something they bring to the table, but now you have established uh, players. And for us as consumers, as users, I think we are quite lucky because we're able to mix and match. So you might be using a service from Amazon and uh, with a service with Google and serve, you know, again, talking to a service in Microsoft Azure. And through the use of APIs, which is uh, application programming interface, all of these can talk to each other. And they're all using the internet as a platform. And one of my colleagues a while ago mentioned the difference between the internet and the web. The internet, as we all know, is the network on which machines are running, and the web is something that you access on port 80 and 443, right? And the, the in, through many of the API calls and everything are happening through established technologies. And very often you can think of this as a computer program myself, as a black box programming. So I don't really care what happens inside the box. All I need to know is how can I talk to it and what do I do with the information that I receive from it? And what happens inside is really not of my concern. And for me, it's just magic. And we all know it's not magic, it's computational behind it. So when you take a look at cloud uh, service models, so very, you know, I think in the initial stages, we had things like infrastructure as a service. We started off with um, things like, uh, what you would describe as a lift and shift. So where you had servers which were being removed from somebody's premises and they were just moved into a data center. So lift and shift were the initial days of uh, cloud computing. And you can see how this was useful. So rather than you know having three servers running in my you know uh, data center in my office, keeping them cool, maintaining them, if I moved them to uh, a data center where others could look after it, I could get economies of scale. And you can see this happening very easily through heating, ventilation, air conditioning. That's again very possible. But you also got the benefit of uh, these machines then being virtualized and instead of having one machine which is hardly used at all, but a physical machine, I could then virtualize it. And a lot of the things with cloud computing were happening at the same time. So we saw the sector of virtualization kind of maturing as it uh, you know, went along, and all of those led to the cloud service models that we see. So that that is how you in, describe infrastructure as a service. So you have, you know, your virtualization server, storage, networking, DC, uh, your data center infrastructure. And again, these are your things that you can touch. Effectively, that's how I would describe infrastructures. With platform as a service, it, it's like it sits between something which we call software as a service, where you have you take care of the platform. So what you're dealing with, like for example, a Google App Engine being a very good example of that, where you just have a runtime environment and what happens underneath it is really not of a concern to yourself, right? Again, the system takes care of that. And again, all of the companies, you know, from uh, Amazon, the, you can either have your database, which is you might your SQL Server database, your Oracle database that you might move from your premise 
to the cloud, or you can use Amazon's own database, which would be DynamoDB. And again, so that is where you have platform as a service. And I think the most common interaction that we have with uh, the cloud would be software as a service. So anyone who's accessing any service through a browser, whether it be Netflix to watch uh, movies or TV programs, whether it be your online, uh, you know, checking your email online through, uh, you know, Gmail, Yahoo, uh, Microsoft Hotmail, we are all in a way consumers of software as a service. And I think software as a service is, is how people, I think, understand cloud computing. It makes it a lot more accessible when you think to yourself that I don't have to run my own servers, mail servers. And again, in my past, when I used to uh, look after mail servers, all of these sort of uh, headache, all of these uh, issues are now taken up. And now you have your email hosted by companies like uh, Gmail or Hotmail who take care of all of that for you. So with cloud service models, you had on-premises, which was a traditional way where you owned and managed everything, right? And this is how, uh, you know, you would be running a data center, you know, you take care of the heating, ventilate, uh, ventilation, air conditioning, security being a very important factor as well. And one, you know, because data again is quite precious, we want to make sure only the right people have access uh, to the data. So that was our, how we used to do things in the past. So then we move to software as a service is when software is accessed online via subscription rather than bought and installed on individual computers and in you know, a Google Apps, Office 365 being good examples of that. And very often with software as a service, you pay per seat. So it all depends on how many users you have and you'll pay on you know for those users. And again, you have to remember that software as a service is not always cheap because you're paying for each user. So if you take a look at uh, you know, say Office 365, if you have, you know, if a person is only using email but not other services, you might still be paying the full whack for that person's subscription. So, again, cloud computing is not a silver bullet. When you're looking at migrating, you know, you think of decommissioning your email server, which you might be running, you need to bear in mind that how many users do you have? And if you start multiplying them by you know, the minimum costs that you pay, you know, which we think of as an individual, these costs can add up. So it's important that when you're looking at migrating services to the cloud, especially in the software as a service model, you consider how much you might be end up paying. And remember, this is perennial. You're going to be paying this every year, every month, right? This doesn't stop. And just as easy as it is to move things from on-premise to cloud, it's also easy to move things from cloud back to on-premise, but it all takes time and it all costs money. So you need to, again, take that into consideration as you're doing that. With infrastructure as a service, uh, what we're doing is providing virtualized computing resources, server storage network over the internet. And examples of this will be the Google Compute Engine, Amazon EC2, Microsoft Azure. And again, as I said, for me, you know, the way I see infrastructure is something that you can touch. So very often it will be, uh, a server that you've moved right uh, across to the cloud, and the re you know, and the reason you might want to do that is either you may not have the space to look after the physical server, or have the resources or the, you know, the manpower to look after that server. So you want to move it to the cloud, and you will see as we go through the slides, there are quite a few different things you can do from storage, you know, uh, from networking, and all of these things can easily be moved to the cloud. Platform as a service is when a third party delivers hardware software tools uh, to users over the internet. And uh, the examples of that, as I said, was Google App Engine, you know, Amazon Elastic Beanstalk. And with this, you are not responsible for what happens underneath the bonnet. That is the responsibility of the cloud provider. And uh, as I said, database is a very good example of um, that if you're trying to move your own, uh, if you're doing a lift and shift, you're moving your on-premise database, over to the cloud, you're still responsible for looking after the database. You know what uh, Amazon, Google, or any of the data center companies or the you know, cloud companies, they just take care of the infrastructure. They make sure that the server is up and running. But it's your responsibility mm -hmm. to make sure that the database is secure. Um, the things about platform as a service is that that responsibility is then moved away from yourself. 
So if, if you take a look at uh, you know, databases, being a very, you know, it's quite easy to talk about it because simple to understand. So if you're using an Amazon, uh, a Microsoft SQL server, which have migrated to the cloud, and you're still looking after that uh, Microsoft SQL server, but if you use something like Amazon uh, DynamoDB, again, you don't have to look after the database. Amazon automatically takes care of it. It will scale it automatically, but obviously all of these things come at a cost. So while you might not be running your database service all the time, 24 hours a day, you might not need to pay for that. But thing like platform as a service, you pay for that cost on an ongoing basis. So again, it's something mm -hmm. worth considering. So if you take a look at with Industry 4.0, when we take a look at uh, all the different companies that we have from things like, uh, you know, company like Airbnb, you know, Best Western, Airbnb, one of the biggest providers of accommodation. But again, they do not own any property if you look at uber captain you know as companies which are in the mobility and transportation business again they don't own any of the taxis any of the vehicles if you look at delivery justy they don't own any restaurants so what you're seeing happening and i think that is what the cloud has made possible in 2020 is that if i have an idea i don't need to go and buy a fleet of vehicles to be one of the world's biggest transportation provider I don't have to go and buy up a whole lot of restaurants to be in the you know food and beverage industry. I'm able to do that, you know, by just offering a service. And I think if you look at you know, if you look back in history and you take a look at the companies like eBay, mm -hmm. effectively that's what they were doing. You know, with when they were what all eBay was doing is was putting one person in touch with another person, and all eBay was looking up was just maintaining the platform. And in effect, that's what Deliveroo, Just Eat, you know, Uber, Captain, Airbnb, and all these other companies are doing as well. One of the things, and again, if we go start looking into the future of cloud computing and see how things are going. So we used to talk about virtual machines. So now we start talking about containers where you have, you know, each virtual server in the past would be looking after its own guest operating system containers run on the single operating system, right, which are installed on the host server. So this is how, again, if cloud computing companies themselves are really looking at how do they run? So in the past, and if you do have an opportunity and you can pop into uh, the science museum, you see the very first uh, data you know, uh, centers, the very first racks, which were effectively, you know, motherboards or, you know, put onto a cork board. And again, they were just connected to each other. So when you start thinking about that's great, not a problem, but in, on a normal, normal motherboard, again, if you think back uh, you know, to a traditional motherboard, a uh, machine in the cloud does not require you to have interfaces for the mouse, an interface for the, for the keyboard. It does not need to have an interface for VGA or for monitor output. So what many of what the companies have started doing is they've started commissioning their own hardware. So again, cloud computing companies are not going out and buying a whole lot of uh, machines from a hardware provider and just sticking them into rack. But they are themselves trying to define how do they start running these machines in the cloud. And again, that's why we're seeing, and one of the cloud companies, one of the few areas where you see, you see a running cost starting to go down. And because again, the cost of running these services is becoming cheap. And again, you know, having used Amazon services a lot over the last few years, you know, they started off with S3, which was their uh, storage solution. Then you had S3 Glacier, you know, S3, you know, sort of uh, you know different variations of you know s3 coming in and each one was cheap and again each one of them catered to a different need so if you wanted to have your information available right here right now you would choose a certain service if you were able to you know, have a bit of patience and you know something like if you wanted to archive some information you could put it away and, and again you would pay lesser amount of money and again if you can think from the cloud computing providers point of view having something immediately accessible means that they have to invest in those resources to make sure they're up and ready. However, if something can be archived so they can put it onto different service. So, and very, and often, and I think this is what makes cloud computing exciting. So those savings that the cloud computing company is making is being passed on to us as a consumer. So with cloud deployment models, we have things like public cloud, which are private cloud, which is on-premise and on-premise and hybrid cloud. And again, you 
when we talk about AWS, we're talking about public cloud. So I've been using AWS over the last few years. And uh, when I first started off with AWS, uh, you know, all you had was a single place. It took a bit of, uh, you know, making the screen quite small to get all of the services in. And what is exciting in that every time AWS has reInvent, which is the annual event, you find new services getting added, right? So every time you go in, there's something new being added. And again, these are just, uh, you know, a snapshot of all the different services which are available on AWS. But just, you know, I'm sitting alongside, you have the Google Cloud Platform, which again has a similar set of services as well. And uh, you know, again, broadly classified in the same area, the terminology may be different, but again, you know, these are all market leaders. These are all uh, you know, best of breed companies who are all competing with each other and trying to do the, offer us the best service. So again, as a consumer, we are spoiled for choice. And uh, similarly, you have Microsoft Azure, which again has a similar set of services as well. And very often companies will start deploying a cloud solution based on their ecosystem. So if you are uh, Microsoft House, you already have, you know, you've already got users on a system, you might possibly go for a Microsoft uh, service because again, it just integrates quite well. But that should not be the only reason all of these services integrate very well. And one of the things, having been to many of the events organized by Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they collaborate with themselves as well. So just if you you know, if you have a database on, uh, on Amazon, you can easily have your authentication done on Azure, right? So they're all designed to work with each other. So as a solutions architect, I'm able to create a solution you know, with a best of breed approach, I can use the best service out there. And again, cost could be a factor as well. So what is the future? Well, in my mind, the three things about what make cloud computing possible are one are the data centers, right? Where all of this information is being kept. The second is the networking, which is the, the huge flow of data between the data centers and between our machine and uh, the machines in the cloud. And the next one is slightly, you know, I don't know how to term it, but you know, what I would call is a paradigm shift, right? And again, I'll try to get into a bit more details in this. So with data centers, and again, we've all heard the news. So when, uh, you know, we were hit by the pandemic, there was a whole issue about that cloud usage went up because many of us were streaming uh, data. We were, you know, whether it be Netflix for entertainment, whether it be carrying out Teams chat or doing webinars. So again, data centers tend to be a huge consumer of energy, right? And uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Ravi Bashrush, uh, who is, looks into data centers. And, you know, so this again is a growing area because data centers do consume a lot of energy. But again, the companies are becoming more and more energy efficient. They are trying to become carbon neutral. And you find a lot of uh, innovation happening in the data center area, you know, where there'd be data centers which are trying to, you know, reuse the, you know, trying to, you know, the air, the hot air that is created, they're trying to reuse it in one way or the other. They're trying to use more, uh, you know, better energy efficiency. So again, data centers is one of the areas where you're seeing, um, you know, improvement taking place. And this is through the heating, ventilating, ventilation, air conditioning, the way, you know, you where the data centers house themselves. So that is, again, it's, a, it's an area in its own right. The other one is networking. And the same way cloud computing companies re-looked at how they looked at a physical computer to say, look, why do I need to have a computer? You know, why do I need to take a motherboard and just then, you know, use it as is? Why can't I re-architect it? So I only use the bits which are useful to myself. So they've looked at networking as well. One of the exciting areas which have come in is something called software-defined networking. And again, a lot of words read over here, but effectively software is doing the job of hardware. And as we all know, software works very fast, is able to handle things a lot better. So software-defined networking is again, one of the paradigm shifts in the cloud computing world. The next thing, and this for me is the most exciting stuff. And this is again, is a comment by uh, Werner Wogels, the CTO of, of Amazon AWS is that no server, right? And again, it's a bit of a, you know, if you take a look at it, so no server is easier right, to manage than no server, right? And again, serverless computing is an exciting area, right? And if you, what do we mean by serverless computing? Well, you looked at the previous examples of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, but now we have something called function as a service, 
right? So AKA serverless computing, right? Which provides a platform which allows compute customers to develop, run, and manage application functionalities without building and managing full apps, right? And it's brilliant because all you do, you only pay for the runtime of that function. So you don't have to worry about provisioning, you know, the virtual machines, continuous applications. So all you do, you pay for the runtime and the two services which you have here is Amazon Lambda and uh, Microsoft Azure Functions. And uh, there's a case study, if you do have time to go to a company called A Cloud Guru, as it happens, a company that is quite prominent in the cloud computing training area. And what A Cloud Guru did, they completely re-architected their infrastructure to make it serverless, right? And the beauty of serverless computing is truly elastic in, in the true meaning of the word, right? So, you know, in the past when you might have to spin up additional servers as demand went up, over here, you're just running functions and the functions will do what you want it to do. And there was a chat, uh, there was a session uh, earlier this week by Andalib Din, who runs AWS Academy. Uh, and again, we'll talk about how UEL is involved in that. And where there was a talk on serverless computing. And very often you find it, you're paying down to the 100th of a second. That's how minuscule the pricing of it becomes. So, th and that for me is the big paradigm shift, which is taking place in the cloud computing area. Now, if you think about Excel, I'm sure you've all come across Excel. And Excel, again, is a good analogy. So if you imagine there were, you know, say, 1,000 developers who created Excel, right? And Excel is a pretty, you know, you know high-powered tool that you have. You know, it does a lot of fantastic stuff. So let's say, for argument's sake, there are 1,000 developers who created Excel. But do you have a billion people who use Excel in different areas, right? You have power users using things like pivot tables. And for me, that's the exciting part of cloud computing is that it is so accessible. So again, you can see the link on the screen. So if you can go to the Teachable machine with Google, so what you have at your fingertips is the power of machine learning, which is accessible to you just through a cloud, right? And you don't have to worry about what happens behind the scene. So what is exciting is that you don't have to know how machine learning works. You don't have to learn about artificial intelligence if you're not in that area, right? So if you want to be the person who just uses it, you're able to do that just by tapping into this resource. The one on the left is an example of a cat flap, which was built by an Amazon engineer, and just by using deep lens and by some technology. And it was created over a you know, few days, right? So, and I think that's what's exciting, is that you're able to tap into all of these things without having to be an expert in this. So to conclude, right, so old is new and the new is old, right? So who needs servers, right? So serverless computing is the future. Rethink your design, be solution driven, right? And again, if you think about, uh, you know, when the people who started Uber delivery, they didn't say, we want to be the biggest transportation company in the world, let's go and buy some taxis. No, be solution driven, think about what is it that you're trying to achieve and then start using that to create your solution. And one of the other modules that I teach is uh, mobile application development. And as I say to my students is that very often, all the processing that is happening is happening in the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. So stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Tap into the power of the cloud. So why, you know, instead of creating your own image recognition software, unless you want to be in that business, tap into the image recognition service provided by Amazon, Microsoft, Google, right? So tap into the power of the cloud. So with that, again, you're very lucky because many of these information is available to you for free. You don't have to pay anything. So quite a few links over here. If you have some time on your hand, I would encourage you to go to any of these things and they have bite-sized learning, uh, you know, uh, courses, right? So which can be from, you know, from an hour to half an hour. So again, just get your hands dirty. That's the best way to learn, right? So with the Microsoft, with their uh, Learn platform on Google Cloud, with their free labs, quick labs is again. And all, you know, as I said, just take a few, uh, you know, a few hours and just get your hands dirty with these things. And with all of these uh, labs and the learning that you have available, you know, they are all dealing with solutions. So very, you know, they're not very theoretical. So they will not be talking, by the way, you know, this is the theory. Very often you're building a solution. And, and, and I think we're quite lucky 
that the companies behind this have provided us with all these this fantastic learning opportunities. Obviously, there's a vested interest behind it, which we all agree, but putting that aside, I think it's a great opportunity and a great, uh, you know, to be using all of this uh, information and research.